this evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming along to the next, the fifth in the Historians Across Boundaries uh, Institute of Historical Research seminar sessions. Uh, really pleased that you've been able to come along this evening and of course uh, that we've got a great lineup of speakers. My name is Mike Esbester and I am one of the co-conveners of this series along with Elsa Churchill, Natalie Pithers and Tanya Evans who are in the crowd this evening and we're going to have a couple of others joining us as we go. This is part of the work that we've been trying to do uh, through the Historians Collaborate movement to encourage better understanding and working between people who are interested in researching the past. Uh, you can find out a bit more uh, particularly on Twitter, uh, if you use the hashtag Historians Collaborate and the Twitter account at HistCollab, um, which hopefully somebody can pop in the chat, um, and also through www.historianscollaborate.com. One of the ways that we think it's important and really hope that we can help that idea about collaboration is by getting to know a bit more about each other in terms of our approaches to the past, including how we do the research that we do. And that is the theme of this evening's session, a day in the life of. And um, hands up anyone else who has constantly been thinking of the Beatles when they see that. Um, I can, couldn't get it out of my head. So we've given each of our five speakers this evening a brief to give us a short insight into what they do. Some of that might be contextual, some of it might be particularly focusing on the sorts of research that they do and their approach to researching the past. We've asked them, a tough brief this one, uh, to speak for a maximum of eight minutes and uh, they will definitely be keeping to that, so thank you very much in advance for that. What I'd really appreciate uh, all of you in the audience, the part other participants, doing as we go is, is listening, enjoying, but also thinking a bit about what you're hearing, how it relates to your experiences in terms of researching the past and the sorts of research that you do. Some of what you hear may be very familiar, some of it may be very different. And it's those sorts of similarities and differences that we, when we go into the breakout rooms after the speakers have, have had their bit, that we'll be asking you to think a little bit about and have a bit of time to discuss. I suspect, that we're going to find that we've all got more in common than the not. But well, let's explore that this evening. So after the speakers have uh, done their bit, I will pop us into breakout rooms for a bit of discussion and we will then come back together uh, for about 10 minutes probably and make sure we end by 9.30 this evening. Hope that sounds okay. I think this is going to work nicely. We're going to take each of the speakers in turn. We've gone alphabetical by first name. Uh, so that means that we are going to start with Kira Gomez. Uh, I'm going to introduce each of the speakers very briefly before they, they do their bit. Uh, so Kira is an independent scholar uh, with a master's from Birkbeck. And Kira, I meant to check this before we started. Have you started a PhD or signed? Are you in the process of applying for a PhD? Yeah, I'm in the process of applying. Thank you. I thought I'd seen that somewhere. So. Um, Great stuff. So her research focuses on all sorts of really interesting things, uh, family folklore, uh, the ways in which traumatic events echo across generations and shape people's life practices, the ethics of writing history, uh, new ways of using oral history, and more generally, histories of crime and conflict. One of the reasons why we're particularly keen that Kira come along this evening is that she's contributed to a number of uh, collaborative events like these in the past as a participant and her discussion so this is going to sound tremendously pressurizing Kira the discussion the contribution she's made have been really interesting really interesting and really insightful um, so we thought that she'd have a lot to to add to this um, we've asked Kira to think a bit about the, the family historian's perspective in particular but also where that might fit in her more more rounded picture as, as a researcher and with that Kira over to you okay thank you I'm just going to share my screen uh, I'm assuming everyone can see that 
Okay. So I'm talking about how I use family history in the work that I'm doing at the moment. So this is a photograph of Shepton Mallet Prison in Somerset, where 18 American servicemen were executed by the US authorities during the Second World War. Um, each of them had been convicted of either murder, rape or both. Um, and as Mike said, I, I'm looking at the ripple effects of those crimes um, and the executions on the subsequent generations in the families of both the perpetrators and the victims. Um, so, I mean, I'm interested in the transmission of trauma across generations, how stories are passed down, but how that structures identities, specifically like family identities. And it's interesting because even when stories are not, not told widely within families, there is a hierarchy of sort of who knows what, who gets told what. And it's really interesting in the context of family history that the advent of online family history websites, DNA testing, has meant that people are finding out things that they weren't ever supposed to find out. Um, and that's that's kind of been a really interesting side thing for my, for my research. So I rely really heavily on oral history interviews um, with the descendants. <clears throat> and I prefer to reach out to people on ancestry.com um, where they have the person I'm writing about listed on their family tree. And I can usually tell from their family tree if they know what happened to the individual. Um, and I do prefer it when they know, because otherwise I kind of lumber in with my big historian clogs on and trample all over everything. Um, but I, I usually open my first communication just by explaining that my priority is that they be made aware of what I'm doing, um, mainly because I want to avoid things like this, which is a story I was told by the niece of a teenage murder victim. Um, yeah. So she told me <clears throat> that there was a short book about murders in Kent published some time ago that included Bee's murder. I mentioned it to mum as I didn't want her to come across it without warning. I got mum to telephone my aunt to warn her, found out that my cousins had never been told the story and neither had my two brothers. So they all had to be informed before they saw the book in local shops. Sometimes I am politely told to go away, um, which is fine. And I have made the decision not to include some stories, either on the basis that the family don't want to be involved. So I just won't mention those specific cases at all. Or if I feel quite uncomfortable about reaching out to them, full stop. Um, so the first thing that I do is I construct a family tree of each person that I'm writing about, quite a basic one. I use ancestry, find my past, Roots Island, um, probably others. Um, and I do this before I even begin contacting families um, because there's often context that I need to be aware of. Uh, each family is obviously different and I don't want to swoop in with my own script and not engage with their specific circumstances. And I think the most dramatic example of this um, is a murder case that I'm researching that took place in Belfast. And I built this really basic family tree and then I set out to search the newspaper archives. So I usually use um, newspapers.com for American families. Um, and then I use the British newspaper archive for families on this side of the pond. But within a few hours of looking at this family, I found that my victim wasn't the first or last violent death in the family. It turned out that his father, that so the murder victim's father had been shot during sectarian violence in the 1920s, died of septicemia. His brother was shot, but survived. Um, his aunt was raped as a, as a teenager. Two cousins burned to death in two separate household accidents, 20 years apart. Um, and then there was the nephew and also a great nephew who died um, in active service with the IRA, um, sort of over subsequent generations in the 1970s and 1980s. So the story I was working on that to me, I had assumed would be kind of this, this big traumatic murder in the family history was really not going to be necessarily the standout violent event in the family. Um, and I felt like I had to tread extra carefully, which I wouldn't have known if I hadn't already constructed the, fam like the family context. Um, sometimes, quite often, I find that 
I am bringing new information to the descendants. And usually this has been well received um, because I think when it comes to family secrets, things that have been kept quiet, they do leave a residue, sort of like the faint whiff that something's not right. Um, and subsequent generations are aware that there is a something, even if they don't know what it is. Um, so unpicking that secret together as a team is quite useful for them as well as for me. It explains certain peculiarities that they long wondered about. And one descendant told me, I never knew my grandmother had a younger brother until I was in my late thirties. We never were told anything at all about his military duties or how he died. I wish I knew more and would love to hear what you do know, because honestly, I'm looking for information on my grandmother's side and I have nothing. And obviously this is where using Ancestry.com is really helpful because the people I'm talking to are automatically already interested in their family history. Um, so she later went on to say um, that after she'd spoken to her mum, she'd found out that the grandmother had talked about her little brother like he was more of a hero killed in England, not such the bad guy. I know that the family here were prideful people. It was a small town he was from and the entire family were involved in the cover up of how he died. Um, and uh, she was completely blown away. She said, thank you for reaching out. So I'm trying to work collaboratively with the descendants as I go along without too much of a hierarchy of historian and subject. But as I grow closer to the cases, um, I do get quite protective about how they're used and how they're misused. <laughs> Um, by other historians who want to make a wider point. Um, so an example of that is that there was a girl, um, probably the worst case that I've written about, a seven-year-old girl who was murdered in County Trone. Um, and a lot of historians have talked about it as if these glamorous American soldiers had arrived um, in, in Ireland um, and that the local kind of country bumpkin population had been confronted by these Hollywood figures. But by using the census and naturalization records um, and uh, passenger lists, I found that actually the little girl had been born in the US, that her parents were Irish, but had briefly emigrated to the States and had lived in Manhattan and Brooklyn and had then come back to Ireland, whereas the perpetrator was actually from middle of nowhere, Ohio. And I think when I read the way that other historians have dealt with these cases, they don't have that family background knowledge. And so they're kind of accidentally misrepresenting in some cases. Um, so, but I mean, I don't approach in a vacuum either. Um, and there has been occasions where I've really disagreed with um, some of the descendants kind of perspectives. So that's been really difficult. And I know I'm running out of time. Um, but I think one of the most difficult things about writing this kind of history is trying to balance the perspectives of the descendants, my own perspectives, um, doing some historical research and contextualizing without going down complete rabbit holes, um, and also balancing my actual paid job. So there, I will, I will stop there so I don't go over my time too much. Thank you. Brilliant, thanks, Kira. By my by my making, you're pretty much bang on. So thank you. That's great. And yeah, really important point at the end. Well, loads of important points in there, um, which are really helpful. But that one about balancing the day to day job versus research and everything. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. That's a, a really helpful start for us. Um, so we're going to move straight on into our second uh, presenter, Margaret uh, Margaret Makepeace. So Margaret's the lead curator for the East India Company records at the British Library. Uh, she's worked with the collections in the India Office Records since 1979. And has, her work's included development of uh, online archival catalogues and of digital document collections. She also uh, manages and contributes to the British Library's blog Untold Lives, uh, which is, uh, I, hopefully you're all familiar with it, but there's some, always some fascinating stories in there, uh, again, looking at the overlooked and often the marginalised. Uh, one of the particular reasons why we're keen to have her along this evening, as well as that experience, is as a qualified archivist, so to lend the archivist's perspective and for us to get some sense of 
what research as an archivist might entail. Margaret, over to you. I'll just share my screen if I can. Is that okay? Can everyone see that? Yep. So this evening I'm speaking about my work as an archivist at the British Library, but my interests overlap with the fields covered by the other speakers. I have a PhD in economic and social history, and I'm also a keen family and local historian. Where my, <clears throat> the screen's not moving on. Uh, Margaret, if you click the mouse, have you got a mouse there? Yeah. It, sometimes I, I find it, if you click that, it will do it, even though it won't do it with the uh, yeah, 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 thank you. <laughs> So, um, as Mike said, my job title is Lead Curator East India Company Records. The East India Company archives are part of the India Office Records, which are a body of public records covering nine miles of shelving at the British Library at St Pancras. We have records for the English East India Company, 1600 to 1858, the India Office, 1858 to 1947, and more than 5,000 collections of private papers. There are also 40,000 maps, as well as prints, drawings, paintings, and photographs. The National Council on Archives identified these priorities for the UK's archive profession, stewardship, access, and creating partnerships. So a typical day for me could encompass working on any or all of these, inquiries from colleagues and the public, and providing advice to individual researchers, cataloguing projects, digitization projects, both commercial and non-commercial, acquisitions and outreach activities, talks, exhibitions, developing and maintaining relationships with stakeholders and blogging. Answering inquiries and providing advice to researchers can be challenging. I tackle most of our team's public inquiries, which fall within the East India Company period. And that's more than 250 years of different people, places and subjects. And this slide shows a remarkably wide geographical spread of the company's trading posts, settlements and contacts from China and Japan, across South Asia and Africa to St Helena and the Americas. And this slide lists some of the main subjects covered in the East India Company records, historical, geographical, scientific and cultural. Some examples of recent inquiries I've dealt with are the opium trade between Calcutta and Penang, legal keys on the Thames, an Australian jockey who died in Agra, Indian railways, East African ivory and Chinese folding fans. We aim through our answers to facilitate access to the records for academics, students, family and local historians and lifelong learners. Sometimes we need to undertake some research before we can respond in a helpful manner, although we can only develop, devote a limited amount of time. Each inquiry could be seen as a micro collaboration with a researcher. And some inquiries develop into long term partnerships between archivists and researchers. Archivists control physical access to documents and we flag up items needing conservation treatment, foliate loose materials and repackage records. But we also give access to complex sets of records through cataloguing, trying to cater for current users and potential new users. I oversee cataloguing projects which increase or improve the data on the British Library's online catalogues, explore archives and manuscripts and the India Office Family History Search. At present, I'm supervising the cataloguing of papers from the political and secret department and the accountant general's department and Indian Navy service files. And the addition of new entries to the India Office Family History Search for Indian soldiers and their families and East India Company sea captains. In-depth cataloguing is resource intensive, but of long-term benefit on a global scale. It is also the first step in preparation for digitization projects. I work on both commercial and non-commercial digitization projects. 
Adam Matthew Digital has a growing East India Company document collection and Find My Past hosts many biographical sources from the India Office records. Both are subscription sites, but free to access in the British Library reading rooms. I also collaborate with the team behind the Qatar Digital Library, which makes copies of India Office records relating to the Middle East freely available online. We also add records to the British Library's digitized manuscripts portal. For example, the letters of William Adams in Japan to commemorate the 400th anniversary of his death in 2020. I deal with acquisitions for the India Office private papers. We have a small budget for purchasing documents and receive regular donations of papers from members of the public. I watch for items being offered at sale at auction and by dealers and put together assessments for items of interest. I liaise with donors over their deposits. We have strict due diligence rules about establishing provenance for acquisitions, which apply equally to all items, whether purchased or gifted. The slide shows one of our recent purchases, an illustrated letter written by Thomas Machel, a traveler and planter in India, whose journals we have held for some years. The catalogue entry on the right relates to the substantial collection of Rayburn family papers, which have been donated to the library by a descendant, with another tranche just arrived and waiting cataloguing. Outreach activities encourage access and the creation of partnerships. I give talks and write about the East India Company records. I advise on suitable items for exhibitions at the British Library and elsewhere. I serve on the Council of the Hacklet Society and act as society archivist. And I liaise with the Brick Lane Circle who have been running projects on the East India Company since 20, 2007. My main outreach activity is managing, editing and writing on the British Library's Untold Lives blog, which shares stories from the past about lives that have been overlooked or forgotten or little known aspects of famous lives. Somebody once misheard the name and was very disappointed to learn that the blog was not actually called Untold Lies. The blog was initially inspired by the interesting and amusing stories we came across in the collections. We believe that it would have a wide appeal and could inspire new research and encourage enjoyment and learning. We post twice a week on what a colleague wants colleague once called a potpourri of subjects. So random stuff is another word for that. With contributions from colleagues across the library, partners in collaborative projects and guest bloggers. I also run the, uh, the associated Untold Lives Twitter account. Writing for Untold Lives is, my, is also my main research activity, uncovering interesting stories in the library's collections to share, investigating and describing little known sets of documents and finding out more about the people named in new acquisitions. And I'll end there and I'll just share our email address in case anyone would like to get in touch with me or any of the India Office Records team if something here has sparked your interest or if you'd like indeed to offer me a guest blog. Lovely, thank you, Margaret. Uh, that was a, a good a good pitch at the end as well, I like that. Uh, but no, really helpful, thank you. And again, the, uh, I like the connections already that are coming out in the, the sense of not pigeonholing as I am an archivist or I am a family historian or an academic or whatever. Um, that's, that's nice. And uh, from my own research interest, I'm particularly uh, glad that you have had that inquiry recently about Indian railways. Um, so that's, that's, that's great. Lovely, thank you very much. So uh, next we're gonna move on to uh, Melanie Backhansen. She is an independent historian, writer and speaker specializing in the social history of UK houses. And she researches and writes in a variety of ways and for a variety of different audiences, sometimes for private homeowners and, and um, uh, often for uh, uh, consultants for uh, television and radio programs, including uh, A House Through Time, uh, some of you may have seen on the BBC, uh, recently co-authoring uh, the book to accompany the series with David Orsuga, the presenter. Um, she has written herself several books on house and street histories, 
and uh, appeared in national media and uh, at, spoken at a range of events for festivals. We have asked her along this evening to give us a perspective in particular of the house historian. So Melanie, over to you. Great. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Um, I don't have a screen to share, so it's just me chatting away, um, but I will get right to it. Um, perhaps just to give, bit, give a bit of context, um, give a brief description of my role as a house historian. Um, it has only really been in recent years that this kind of uh, role has become more prominent um, and this field of history is sort of becoming standalone. Um, and there are actually several variations in those who research the history of houses, um, with some looking far more at the architectural history, um, while others might start in local history or, or genealogy and then start branching out into house history. Um, but I have always specialised in the social history of houses, very much telling the stories of the people who've lived in the house. Um, I focus on uh, all the people that have come and gone in the life of the house through different periods, starting with when the house was built and possibly who built it, um, then telling all the stories of the owners and the occupants through time, much like you might have seen in the BBC programme, A House Through Time. Um, I am freelance um, and most of my clients are private homeowners or corporate clients. Um, alongside this, I give talks and write articles. Um, and as mentioned, I also work as a consultant for radio and television. I also occasionally tutor the house history module for the University of Dundee. Um, this way of working means I'm very much guided by budgets and time limits, um, depending on the parameters of each project and the desires of each client, particularly with homeowners where a house history can range from a brief report of a few pages all the way through to an entire book. Um, so what does this mean for my day to day? Um, I have to admit, it took me a while to gather my thoughts on this, um, a day in the life, um, as I, I don't really have a typical day. Um, it's always different. Um, although the subject of house history research remains the same, um, every house and every project will be different. It can depend on the location of the house as well as its age, um, but also the depth of research that's required depending on the budget of each client and the purpose of the research. Um, firstly, the location can be a, a huge factor as most documents for related to, to house history will be based in the county record office or the town, city or borough archives where the house is situated. Um, but then like any research, there are options held elsewhere. Um, for example, I researched a form of vicarage in Hertfordshire, um, but it was formerly part of the Diocese of Lincoln, so the church records were in Lincolnshire. Um, I researched a house in Gloucestershire that used to be in Worcestershire, but actually the ownership records were in Birmingham. Um, London houses can have collections in the London Metropolitan Archives as well as the local borough archives. Um, I'm currently researching a house in Salisbury, which was formerly owned by the cathedral. So archives are held both in Salisbury and the county record office in Chippenham. Um, and then of course, there are other op op documents in the National Archives as well as the British Library um, and others such as estate ownership collections, church records, etc. cetera. Um, it's all fun and games, <laughs> lots of traveling around. Um, and I do love it, but it can add um, hours, if not days, to the time it takes to research a house. Um, the recent pandemic has also meant that archives have reduced opening times. Um, but one of the additional challenges has also been the need to pre-book appointments, but in particular to pre-book documents. Um, in a lot of cases, house history research will be guided by evidence found in other sources. Um, so it becomes a fun game of trying to pre-order documents based on information you don't have yet. Um, so there you are. Um, but to give you a glimpse of my day in the life, um, I recently finished researching the history of a house in Gloucestershire, uh, while starting research into a house in Fulham in London, another in Belgravia, and another in Salisbury. Um, in addition, I was working on a Radio 4 series which required researching the history of 10 houses across the country. Um, and that was very much reliant on online records. Um, the research in Gloucestershire required pre-ordering as many documents as I could within the limit of 10 documents a day, 
although thankfully the Victoria County history had wonderful references, which gave me very big starting points for the documents I needed. Um, alongside this, I also needed to book accommodation and, and the logistics of traveling and being away for a week. Um, in comparison, uh, I can walk to Hammersmith Archives for the Fulham House, but they are only open two days a week. The Belgravia House was formerly part of the Grosvenor Estate and permissions were needed in advance from Grosvenor to request the archive material. And Westminster Archives are also only open two days a week. Um, thankfully, two different days to the Hammersmith one, <laughs> so made it slightly easier. Um, in essence, it becomes a bit of a logistical challenge to plan research trips and archive visits. Um, and that's even before the research has begun. Uh, but what does my day look like? Using the Fulham House as an example, I requested as many specific sources I could find in the archive catalog and in conversation uh, with the archivist. Um, but before heading to the archives, I would start with online research. Um, thankfully, in house history, there's a massive improvement in the sources becoming available um, and being digitized, and this makes things easier, um, particularly things like we're all familiar with census, electoral registers, directories and newspapers, um, but also things like the tithe map um, on the genealogist site um, and other maps, including ordnance survey and other sites um, where maps are available, like layers of London or know your place in, in West Country. Um, Although with most of these sources, it is still not possible to search by address. So it can take time to search by parish, ward, district, and so on. Uh, although sometimes even this is not available um, and it's, it's still only searchable by a person's name. And in many cases, early records don't actually um, include an address and don't clearly identify a house. And that's actually one of the, the challenges with house histories. Um, so setting off to Hammersmith, Thankfully, the archivist had compiled the archive material um, that she had in her store. Um, plus, the local directories and the electoral registers were on the open shelves. Um, but the key source I needed were the rate books. Um, and these are essentially like council texts that we have today, um, but they were all on microfilm. Um, and they have a fantastic collection, which is brilliant. Um, but prior to the 1850s, no street names or houses are clearly identified. So it is just literally a list of names of everyone in the parish paying the rates. So in order to track the house, it becomes um, quite, quite a challenge. Um, but in addition to this, uh, the local history details are very um, limited and also a little bit odd, um, needless to say, extremely unhelpful. Um, basically, with one source stating the house was built in the early 1800s, um, while another said it was built in the early 1700s. Um, then a nearby house had a similar name and inevitably the two became confused during different periods. So for a few days, I literally turned up, turned on a microfilm reader and sat there all day going through micro, uh, rate books on microfilm from the mid 19th century all the way back to the early 1700s. To offer a slightly different day in the life, um, this week I traveled down to Salisbury to visit the cathedral archives, um, which are amazing by the way. Um, and they had piles of leases and lease records to work through. Although again, the houses were not clearly identified and to, uh, until later in the 19th century. And the first bundle of deeds turned out to be the neighboring plot of land, while another was actually for the stables and the um, uh, neighboring buildings. So, um, and as I mentioned, I uh, look at the social history. Um, so actually once I've gathered an enormous list of owners and occupants, it then takes time to delve into their stories, looking at genealogical sources, um, newspapers, military records, and, and many more to piece together more about who these people actually were and, and, and their time in the house. Um, so while the sources will be similar, um, deeds, maps, census, rate books, etc., each house will be different based on the age of the house, its location, um, as well as what records survive plus the desires of each client and their budget um, will determine how long I can spend on that research. For example, the Belgravia house was built in 1829 and it took seven days to research and write a short report on the history of the house. But in comparison, uh, last year I researched a house in Essex built in the 1520s and that took 44 days to research and write a full history which is being bound into a book. 
So after a quick run through, um, it's safe to say uh, none of my days are, are very similar. <laughs> um, but my, my work is very much like solving a mystery and, and piecing together different parts of a puzzle. Um, but I love what I do. I genuinely love piecing together stories of people from the past um, through the life of the house. No, thanks. That's great. I love that idea about solving a mystery. Um, that's, yeah, I think that's something that probably a lot of people here will relate to. But wonderful. That's really helpful. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to move straight on to uh, Paul, Paul Driver now. Uh, he is a principal record specialist at the National Archives at Kew, specialising in medieval records, particularly those relating to government and society in the British Isles in the 13th and 14th centuries. That means he has a particular interest in ensuring the uh, teaching, transmission, understanding of necessary linguistic and paleographic skills uh, in order to access, understand, use pre-modern records. Uh, Paul's a co-investigator on the Arts and Humanities Research Council funded project, The Northern Way, which is looking at the role of the Archbishops of York in the 14th century and is producing and will continue to produce a really fascinating, important resource for all sorts of research, but including local history, uh, in that case, in the medieval north of England. And it's with a local history hat on that we've asked Paul to speak to us this evening, uh, particularly as he's currently the acting chair of the British Association for Local History. Uh, so, Paul, if you could give us your perspective on a day in the life of the local historian. OK. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. Um, I should also add, I, I, I like a hat. So not only am I, am I work at TNA and I've got the BALH hat, I'm also Honorary Secretary of the Lincoln Record Society. I'm one of the general editors of the Pipe Roll Society and I'm president of the Mortimer History Society, which is like a local history society for the medieval marches of Wales. So I, I have many different varied jobs. And I, I think as Melanie was saying and everybody else has been saying, no two days are the same, my job, my life, my research life is very varied, as are the people, the places and sort of the communities that I have to deal with on a daily basis. And I think for me, and I think for others have said, that's kind of the joy of the role in many ways. It's the variety, both in what you do, but also the, the, the things you come in, in, in into contact with. So at sort of at TNA, kind of from a local history hat on, um, everything we do, sort of research does permeate every aspect of our work. Um, and we have to fit in, as I'm sure Margaret will tell you, you have to fit into, in, into our research strategies, into archives Inspire. So although our collection is national, in the sense that it's the, the collection of UK government or the English royal government going back to doomsday and beyond, we also have many, many collections for which, you know, there is a massive local, local history element to it. And also vice versa, getting, making, going out from the local into the national. Um, but, um, but all the collections I work on, generally speaking, because they are the medieval or the, the pre-modern ones, I think, at TNA. And at TNA, pre-modern is kind of 1782 and backwards, because 1782 is when the Home Office and the Foreign Office are set up. So everything before then, we count as pre-modern. Um, and of course, that does require some specialist skills that a lot of members of the public wouldn't necessarily have, a lot of research students don't have. So a key part of our role is to actually bring those skills and experiences to all audiences, really. I mean, re I've, I'm, I've done a day in life recently, I gave a, um, a, one of our Friday afternoon medieval tips webinars, it was literally me talking for 30 minutes about medieval records at TNA. And within that, I was able to use some local examples. So for example, we've been doing quite a lot of cataloging recently on our deeds collections. So while, while lots of our ancient deeds have been well known because they were catalogued, you know, in the, in the Victorian Edwardian eras of, of uh, description and publication, we've recently completed the cataloging of two series. So one is um, Ward 2, which is um, the deeds and evidences of the Court of Wards. So although it's a, an early modern court, actually litigants would bring in their medieval records. And we've had a project involving some sort of volunteers, some um, contracted researchers and then members of our team to actually improve the descriptions of those. And I think we've got mm, several thousand new descriptions 
Um, and there's all, all over the country, there's big collections relating to, for example, Burnham Thorpe in Norfolk. There are a collection relating to Pul the Pulteney family in Leicestershire, which include everything, you know, just from basic deeds all the way through to pedigrees, you know, really, really nicely drawn pedigrees. Uh, and also another thing we've recently done is a series called Whale 31, which is the modern deeds of the Court of Great Chestons in Chester. So there's a massive new material, sort of early modern Chester, northwest, northwest, oh, sorry, northeast Wales, that we've been we've been able to bring to um, greater light through my collaboration with um, our cataloging team. Uh, and one of the things I should say about that is, with with one exception, our cataloging team are all archivists, as, as I am a qualified archivist. But because modern archive schools are not teaching in sufficient depth and longevity the skills that you need to understand pre-modern records we're finding that you know our cataloging team are coming to rely on us for you know help even with, with basic sort of catalog amendment inquiries that kind of thing um more as part of the kind of cataloging more broadly we have to work with um both internal co um, colleagues and external academics um to improve either the catalog or access to uh, local history records. So I've recently been able to um, put a successful funding application in to our friends of the National Archives to fund the digitization of two of the medieval illuminated counter books of the Duchy of Lancaster. Effectively, that kind of work as the, the, the Duchy of Lancaster, which is the private estate of the Queen as Duke of Lancaster, um, as kind of the, the medieval doomsday of Lancaster. So there's these two sort of really quite nicely illuminated manuscripts from, and you know TNA doesn't really have much in the way of illuminated manuscripts and we, we've put together a proposal where we've got a specialist researcher come in do the cataloging and create a spreadsheet which will really bring out the the local history dimension that's buried within these um in these um what are these 600 year old records and actually now we'll be able to have increase vastly increase the amount of references to not just largest communities but also down to the level of field names um you know water water sources that kind of thing in not just the northwest of england but also the duchy has lands in lincolnshire in leicestershire in in yorkshire and also obviously the, the savoy palace and places like that so lots of in terms of local history at least lots of my job recently has been or is trying to improve access to those collections then to work with both academics and well hopefully the hopefully is the, the public if we can as many many people as possible and i don't know how many of you are aware particularly those of you in the postgraduate community that tna runs a postgraduate archival skills training set of workshops we've just held the introductions this week which is for everybody and then after christmas we're going to hold the kind of the skills and methodology workshops which is where we go much more in depth by period or by type of records. So our visual collections team, for example, they do one visual collections, which actually doesn't include things like medieval wax seals, but it probably should. Um, and we, we know in those training sessions, we try and give students a much better handle on kind of the skills they'll need, the approaches they'll need to take, and the sort of the resources that are really useful for local history in this particular context. So obviously Melanie's already mentioned BCH, but things like the EPNS, English Place Name Society, British History Online, just for all the printing resources as well, and then Layers of London. But I should also do a plug, plug, plug for those of you out there who are um, fans of taxation records. The E179 database is one of the great resources out there for local history, because although you, know, you, you can't search it by person, even though all, of course, all the records are, you know, a lot of the particularly the assessments of individuals are a great resource for family history and lo local community history. But you can search by place and actually build up a great picture there of local communities through time, basically from around 1200 to 1700. And I really should make a, a plug for that. Um, did you, I, mean, I don't know whether you wanted me to say anything about the Northern Way project, or whether I've run out of time. You, you've probably got 30 seconds left. Do you okay. want to get something in quick? So, so this is a big AHRC project, it's just coming to an end. It's literally um, a new web resource. Um, which is part of the York University's Archbishop's Registers project, where we've literally created new descriptions of the registers of the, the, the Latin registers of the Archbishop of York from 1304 to 1405. Um, they're searchable in English now, 
and they're also linked with descriptions of relevant ecclesiastical records at TNA to hopefully build a, a totally new interpretation of the history of the Northern Church and its intersection with, with government. So. Brilliant, thank you, Paul. Um, that's yeah, really helpful. Again, that capturing that variety of, of what you were doing. Um, again, particularly nice to hear you know, fans of taxation. Who doesn't like a good bit of taxation? And I say that as someone who's researched and written on 19th century taxation forms. So there we go. You found a fan in me. Um, Marvellous. We are going to move on to our final uh, presenter this evening, Tanya, uh, Tanya Evans. She is the director of the Centre for Applied History at Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia, from where she joins us. Uh, so uh, early morning there for her. Thank you very much, particularly for doing that. Her research focuses on family history and public history. Uh, some books include Family History, Historical Consciousness and Citizenship, uh, which is out next year, and Fractured Families, Life on the Margins in Colonial New South Wales. She's recently started a new project with family and local historians and archaeologists in the Blue Mountains in Australia, and is one of our co-conveners for the Historians Across Boundaries uh, seminar sessions and part of the Historians Collaborate Collective. We've asked Tanya to say a little about the perspective uh, of the academic historian. Tanya, over to you. Thanks very much, uh, Mike. And it's, it's, it's uh, can you hear me and everything? Can you see? Yep. yep. Oh, fantastic. I was going to say, it's been brilliant hearing from all of you. I can't tell you how helpful this will be as a teaching resource. So I've, I've got my researcher hat on, but also my teacher hat on as well. Um, and it's great. And as, as I said in a, in a tweet, I was just uh, sending out these seminars have been one of my huge joys this year. So it's great to be here chatting with you all again. So I'm here to talk about being an academic, uh, which I've done quite a bit um, this semester because I've been um, trying to demystify what being an academic is for lots of our masters of research students and I, I think they often come into high degree research with sort of fantasies about what academics actually do. I am a 40-40-20 academic uh, like lots of my colleagues. I imagine Mike are you a 40-40-20 academic as well? Um, it, this is a model yeah. that has Yep, you are. This is a model that uh, lots of academics have been structured by uh, for some time, but it's a model that is increasingly under threat. Um, our teaching workloads uh, are rising and it is becoming much harder to combine our teaching and our research selves. Um, I'm also a level D, I'm an associate professor of history, so my capacity to research has transformed dramatically over the course of my career. I got my PhD from the University of London in 2002. I moved to Australia um, in uh, 2008, where I was appointed as a level A um, because I was a research fellow. And this was a little bit, uh, because I was a research fellow, it's a little bit, bit like doing a PhD. I spent three years just immersed in research. And now as a level D, 40, 40, 20, uh, my capacity to research is much diminished. Um, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. And what has also changed as a result of COVID and the sort of increasing financial um, uh, kind of retrenchment of universities means that also we used to have dedicated research time. So every four years, we would be promised um, a, a semester off teaching to allow us to undertake our research and to, to write our work. Um, OSP has been on hold for two years. I was one of the lucky last to come through with OSP. And I actually wrote my last book on family history um, funded by um, a sabbatical and uh, during two periods of OSP. I started the research in one of them four years later, I wrote up that research. So it was really important time for me to undertake my work. And OSP now is becoming increasingly competitive and you have to have a very, very um, strong track record in order to, to obtain it. So these are things that have really transformed um, academic life in the last um, couple of years. And th that transformation has happened very, very quickly. Um, I think it's worth mentioning um, because again, people have these fantasies about academic life that aren't necessarily true. 
Now, last week, um, I posted on Twitter that I was off to my first archival trip in four years. Four years! What kind of historian am I, for goodness sakes? <laughs> um, I couldn't believe it had been four years since I've been in an archive, and partly that was because of COVID, you know, as Melanie was talking about, you know, our capacity to enter archives has been much reduced in the last little while. But it also um, is a sign of um, my um, location in the academic spectrum uh, as an associate professor. Um, I am often leading research teams and I have wonderful research assistants that I manage and do a lot of my archival research for me, which is both brilliant, but also a bit sad because I don't get to go to the archives. So I was incredibly excited that I went off to the Blue Mountains Historical Society last week and immersed myself in, in the archive. Um, and I hope to get back there soon. But it's actually also a sign of how my research has transformed. I started off as uh, my PhD was on 18th century London, um, and it was entirely archivally based. Um, uh, at now, a lot of my research, um, partly because I have less time to do my research, um, involves an entirely different methodology. I do a lot of survey work. I do a lot of oral history work. Um, I do much less archival work, which is much more labor and time, well, not, not more labor intensive, but it's much more time intensive and it requires trips that I might not be able to do because of my other commitments. And I've got three kids and a dog and my capacity to travel isn't <laughs> as, uh, as, as free as it was when I was younger and without children. So one of the things I did with my students um, this semester in order to de demystify what it is I do, because I think they um, think that um, we get to just research a lot of our time and to write, um, is to, to demonstrate how the 40-40-20 uh, worked out. So this is my what I have done this week slide, and I've tried to divide up the, what I do in terms of teaching, um, as I've said, has become much more labor intensive. I have many more students that I'm responsible for um, now than I did perhaps five years ago. Um, and also the administration around teaching um, has increased as well. Um, there's a lot more paperwork involved with teaching and we're at the end of semester. So there's a lot of marking and finalization of marking to be done. Uh, because I'm a level D academic, my service role, my um, service to the university, my leadership um, positions have increased as well. I sit on a lot of university committees, which means a lot of meetings, a lot of uh, meeting prep. Academic Senate next week means that I have to read 400 pages of documents before attending that meeting. Um, and because the university is transforming rapidly at the moment, it's important to read those documents very closely uh, to ensure um, that uh, I am representing my academic colleagues as, as much as I am able to. Um, so I take those roles very seriously. There's also um, other service roles uh, that I undertake, not just for the university, but outside the university as well. Um, as Mike says, I'm I'm a co-convener of this seminar. I love collaborating in these kinds of partnerships and I collaborate in lots of international partnerships. I'm involved with the International Federation of Public History as well. Um, and I recently set up a new um, network of public historians across Australia and New Zealand. And I do quite a lot of work around that. But the research bit, the bit that I'm supposed to be talking about. Um, so this week I'm finishing off a book review and, and I'm managing a research assistant who's doing some quantitative work um, that's helping to inform that book review. Uh, I've publicizing and thank you, Mike, for, for retweeting. A a special issue of life writing the journal life writing that is on uh, that is a special um, issue on family history and life writing so I hope uh, some of you Natalie um, I'm looking at you and I might think about submitting an abstract by the deadline next uh, Tuesday I'm working on a new funding bid from the Australian Research Council with a large team of researchers next week it's the Australian Historical Association conference where I'll be presenting my work on the Blue Mountains um, I'm wanting to draft an article before Christmas, we all have these tasks we're trying to tick off before Christmas. I'm hoping I get to one of these tasks, that would be amazing. Um, and I also have lots of PhD students as well that I have to um, talk to them about their research and guide them and, and they've had a tough couple of years as well, but that is also one of the joys of my job. So that gives you a rough idea of my week. Um, and sometimes there's more teaching and sometimes there's more research. It's busy, it's diverse, and as, as Melanie said, one of the things you know I love about I love about my job is that there's never one the day is the same and that is you know this is one of the reasons I just 
I just really, really love what I do. Um, as Mike said, um, my books, my recent books have been structured around family history, and this is absolutely crucial to the kind of work that I do and the kind of collaborative nature of the work that I do. Um, and my current Blue Mountains project um, involves going off to the gorgeous Blue Mountains. Some of you, most of you, I imagine, have not been there, um, but it's a spectacular uh, space. And what we're doing in that area, I'm working as part of a large team um, of archaeologists, social historians, oral historians, and historical archaeologists, um, as well as our consult, uh, consultant historians who um, work in the Blue Mountains on various sites, the Blue Mountains World Heritage Institute and the National Parks and Wildlife Service, um, to bring to life um, a history of a forgotten shale mining settlement in the Blue Mountains. So the Blue Mountains are now renowned for their beauty. They're an area, you know, they're, they're, it's a World Heritage Site, UNESCO um, site. Um, but what we're trying to do is to unearth the history of, of, of mining, of shale mining and of the working class in the Blue Mountains and to show how the competing demands of um, the tourist industry and the mining industry played out in the 19th century that has a huge impact on the way we understand the Blue Mountains today. You know, most of us have no understanding of that industrial history of the Blue Mountains and, and our work is structured around bringing to light that history. Um, these tiny um, settlements of miners in, godforsaken homes, you know, in desperately um, damp, um, desperate conditions, you know, these alcoholism is rife through these settlements, violence is rife through these settlements, um, it, industrial accidents, there's a wonderful history of the railways um, that is, is coming out in this history as well, Mike, we've got to mention the railways whenever we can, and, and, and I, because I'm the kind of historian that I am, for me, my focus is using oral histories, is using surveys, is using uh, collaborative knowledge of this area, to bring to light the history of women in particular, because our understanding of the history of mining is, is, so, is so male dominated, but actually these women are absolutely crucial to these communities and so are their children. You know, these children are working in these mines as well. So my work is absolutely um, focused upon bringing to light um, these marginalized histories, which has been a, an aspect of my work uh, throughout my whole career. So I will end there. Thank you. Great stuff. Thanks, Tanya. Uh, again, a really a very quick, as all our presenters have been run through of what it is that, that you actually do, That's but really helpful. So we've heard from uh, five different, but in some ways similar perspective on research and how that fits in with wider jobs, lives, etc. Um, hopefully you all enjoyed the conversations uh, in your breakout rooms. I certainly did uh, in, in the one that I was involved with. Would anyone from any of the breakout rooms it can be the facilitators it can be others like to give us a few of the comments a few of the things you discussed in your rooms yeah mike happy to to jump in we had a very lively conversation um around paul uh, with his many hats um and we had some really great conversations around the challenge that different researchers have of getting access not just to content but to expertise um, and the fact that there are less generalists and even the specialists are being withdrawn and therefore it's very hard for a range of researchers to know what you need to ask for what's actually there and maybe some of the impact of the pandemic on being able to pursue a, an old-fashioned way of research where you can browse things and then order the next things on the same day, that serendipity of exploration. And that seems to be a common theme from several of the researchers. Um, we also explored um, with, with Zoe actually was on the call, um, some of the impact of, of, of training, um, who's just completed a course of study as uh, an academic, um, but looking to go into the profession to help other researchers. And the fact that maybe we need to look at different skill sets coming into organisations to maybe have a broader range of voices from the researchers being reflected into the way we run and set up the research institutions so that there is a greater sensitivity to research needs from across the board rather than a sector focused, an archive is for archivists, run by archivists, which I think we've seen beginning to change as our demands um, shift. Really fascinated by comments by Joe, um, who was into musicology. 
um, and had been looking at doing some family history to hone research skills and develop them. But this sense that her research was to be able to perform um, to perform music, but actually for many of us, it's about a different sort of performance, performance via writing, performance via presentation, performance via a television programme, which got us threaded into how we can inspire another generation through some of that light touch research, but with incredibly creative ways. And Paul shared the story um, of the naughty nun, Joan of Leeds um, from the Northern Way, which has been used to inspire young people around the world and that a young people's theatre group had picked it up and performed it, which then made this thing go viral and global to the point where they're getting Hollywood scripts. I bet there'll be the Netflix Naughty Nun series coming soon. So it was a really eclectic and wide ranging set of conversations, which I think really got into um, the fact that a day in the life of is different for every person no matter what their genre is, almost as they encounter different collections and archives. Really fascinating comments coming through. Great, thanks, Nick. What a wonderful um, set of discussions you've obviously had in that room. Uh, you know, thanks to, to you for the summary, but thanks to all involved in that. Great stuff. Um, any from any other rooms? Oh, I'll go next. We, we had a small group um, and a lot of the, the presentations really resonated with our lives and particularly the variety and the juggling. Um, and we thought actually there was a lot of positivity about what we presented, what was, what was presented. We sometimes wondered, um, as our, a lot of our research careers might have progressed, how much we actually got involved. And particularly we, we thought, you know, being in, with Paul, Paul and his many hats, how many of us were in, you know, dreaded committees and the, the, the you know, just, just the, the sheer fact that we, we got more and more administrative jobs and less and less hands-on interest stuff you know um there was actually a quite quite an interesting discussion about the precariousness of freelance work um getting the jobs the the real the real strain that the, the last two years has put on that you know the, the, the problems of covid the closure of access and then the and in a way be a little bit of a privilege of those of us who were in institutions that actually gave us a salary and the ability to have a variety of jobs and things like that and all the interesting things as well. So we, we were very, very clear, very aware of the, of, the, of the security sometimes versus the insecurity of, the, of our world. And um, yeah, no, I think those were, it was just the hugeness, the, the actual sheer variety, I think was the thing that, I think people will be surprised from our world of how the reason we're there is because it does keep our mind buzzing and things and, and variety. I think is what it was. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Yes, I like that. Uh, again, that definitely the variety, but yes, keeping the keeping the mind uh, <laughs> there. That's 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 really nice. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, anything else from either of the other rooms? I can go next if you like. I think we Thanks. were, um, we thought that there was, although people's individual roles were very varied, we thought it was interesting that every role was so varied. So there, there wasn't any role where one person was kind of doing less varied stuff than any other um, role. And we also talked about the uh, the kind of the joys of digitalization and the opportunities that come with that but also some of the pressures that actually puts on individuals in those roles so that they might be really enjoying doing these collaborative um things and projects like this it's also yet another pressure when they're split um so much we all thought tanya you must be exhausted and we didn't know how much how, you, <laughs> how you balanced it all in your head so um, and we were also surprised by uh, just how varied the archivist roles were in particular. There were there were some things that we expected and there was quite a lot that we didn't. So I think everything else has kind of generally been covered by the other comments. But also, I think similarly, as you say, then we noticed how much the enjoyment, everyone clearly, yes. you know, was enjoying what they were doing, which is, uh, which is great. And it gives meaning to people's lives as well. I think that came across, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Maxine. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much, Natalie, for summary. But Maxine, also for that, that point about the, you know, fundamentally the reason, one of the reasons why we end up doing what we're doing. And we should recognise that there are challenges, of course, but there's so much interest, there's so much pleasure and enjoyment that we do get out of it. Um, that, that, you know, we stick with it and we stick with it for a reason. So it's important to remember that. Thank you. 
Um, Tanya, did you want to say anything from your? We, we yeah, we we really focus on on the perceived or real divide between academics and other types of researchers. Um, Karen's new to family history, so she talked about the imposter syndrome a lot, um, and I told her she should ditch that. <laughs> um, and we also talked. I mean, uh, Mel's amazing route into her role um, via an estate agent, but that's another story for another day, uh, which is brilliant, and I can't wait to hear more and on another occasion. Um, <laughs> but we also talked a lot about training and skills development and about how, you know, Karen and other types of researchers can pick up skills, what kind of courses uh, and where they might find that kind of support for their work. So we have um, sent her your way, Elsa, and, uh, and uh, all of our local and the British Library because there are such fantastic resources out there. Sometimes we just need to collect them and to remind ourselves of them. And, and I don't know if there's anything else that anybody else would want to add to that. That sounds not sounds like okay great summary yeah thank you uh, again really really nice there and yes imposter syndrome I suspect we all suffer from it in <laughs> some way shape or form unfortunately um, brilliant so I was I was in the, the fifth room and again really really interesting conversation about all sorts of things again think about the variety of things that were covered we focused a little bit towards the end about uh, partly about thinking about the differences but actually more more about the similarities between what we'd heard from from the presenters and our own experiences and the, the comments I think that there were I think Sadie mentioned that there were more similarities and differences which is really brilliant to hear mm. and you know really positive thing because I think that's that's one of the things that we knew is the the conveners behind these sessions coming together from different backgrounds to think about this that we could see those similarities but hearing you all saying that and seeing that is is, is wonderful um and yeah, Jane made a very interesting comment about kind of not, not coming to historical research from the background of a historian, having been sadly put off at school by school history, uh, but coming back to it subsequently, so again, through a slightly different route and kind of getting into it. And, you know, Vicky made a great comment about on, on a census, she puts down, you know, she's a historian. Uh, it's lovely, pure and simple, it doesn't matter what type of historian, a historian, uh, <laughs> um, which we all are fundamentally. Um, but Jane then came to say, well, actually, and this is a comment, I think, perhaps to, to wrap up on, because it's a really lovely thing, a wonderful way of, of encapsulating what we're trying to do here. So every time I come to one of these sessions, I feel more like a historian. Uh, that's that's great. And, you know, I think that's that's really positive. Uh, and, and it's made by day, frankly. Yeah. So <laughs> that's that's lovely. Thank you, Jane, in particular for that. Um, with, with that in mind, uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming along this evening.